Hello and welcome to another episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. I'm Dylan. I'm your host, and Matt is not with us today. He had a client meeting, so it's uh, just going to be me and our illustrious guest. Todd is the sector leader of the manufacturing and product development sector within the National Architecture and Engineering Firm, HED. Uh, has over 20 years of experience working for both small and large firms in the Detroit area. And as we were just talking about, I was right in the Detroit area uh, here a couple of weeks ago. Really last week. I don't know. I've been traveling so much that uh, time is <laughs> not linear anymore. Um, Todd's also a member of the Michigan Construction Code Commission Board. That is a mouthful um, of directors. And Todd is perfectly positioned to speak about um, and I can't wait to dive into this about innovation, improving speed of market and manufacturing, supply chain, which we're going to dive into, uh, and design for automotive and battery technology. So with that, Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dylan. Glad, uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So one of the big things that I always like to ask our guests is what in the world got you into construction? you know, to this big uh, world of architecture and engineering? Sure. Well, it happened uh, at the uh, ripe age of 10. I was 10, I was 10 years old and I had this uh, crazy idea that I wanted to be an architect and um, what I grew up into the Detroit Lake area. So highly like influenced by, you know, the automobile and all of those great things. I went to a like auto show when I was a kid and um, just amazed by um, how they, they kind of um, how like a car went from concept to like a full model. Um, so for a brief period of time, I wanted to design cars, but uh, quickly kind of went back to the drawing board kind of speak and went into like architecture. And then uh, once I got got into it, I just never stopped and then turned it into a, a pretty good career. I was I'm, I'm very pleased with the direction it went, but it's strange how I never really realized how much architecture had to do with construction. And, you know, again, being young, didn't, didn't really know that it kind of <laughs> figured it out pretty quickly that we're a pretty big piece of the pie. I guess in that, what made you stay? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did, and, no. <laughs> uh, you know, really it's, the you know, uh, I, you know, I guess for all, all, all like architects, we have what, you know, somewhat of like, of like an ego saying, well, you know, that building's mine or I had a part in that. It's really, um, you know, what, uh, been enjoyable to, to actually have a part of a project and to actually walk into it and see it built. The best part about my part about my job is to see things get, get, uh, you know, to get constructed and built. And, um, I'm a kind of a problem solver by nature. So this career choice was a, a really good one for me. Um, I've been in project like management for, 15 plus years and now i'm a, a a principal running the you know you know like the studio here for uh like hed and just being around this like area i um had a kind of an early dip into the manufacturing side uh working for for most of uh, the larger uh like manufacturers around here but also doing uh, a breadth of like other work as well yeah that's interesting because I mean, especially there in Detroit, right? Like if you see a car that is not American, right? If you decide yeah. to to drive a Honda or yeah. Toyota or, you know, heaven forbid, a German car, oh man, like you better watch your, your doors. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I find it strange when I do travel, um, you know, what around the country um, that, wow, there's not as many you know, Ford and GM and Chrysler vehicles, like on the, 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 you know, but, you know, I have to admit though, we do work for, for all those like other, uh, like automakers as well. But, um, for most part, um, yeah, when you're, when you're like in Detroit, there's a pretty heavy influence on American, uh, made and that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pride of ours. Like I, like I suppose. Yeah. Well, and it's just that, I mean, they're in Detroit, right. The motor city you're exposed to, all this manufacturing and then all the suppliers end up, you know, congregating around, um, 
the whole area, right, to yeah. serve the big three. And I guess it makes so much sense to be, you know, that you're headquartered there, that getting into cars, going to the factory early in, you know, at 10, right? <laughs> like mm-hmm. allows you to to see that kind of from start to finish and then to, I guess, keep that kind of spirit alive, if you will, in, you know, the manufacturing and to continue to be excited about um, what's going on within automotive yeah. and within manufacturing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you know, it's strange because um, lately, um, you know, it's been a big shift, right? We're seeing this, um, I don't call it like a new revolution, but it's, I mean, you know, it is starting to, to really change around here. Um, so we do a lot of work on the testing and development side, and that's where we've been seeing a lot of change. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's strange um, that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, alternative fuels were kind of like a pipe dream. Uh, What and now it's, um, you know, it's quite a huge thing, right? Um, You know, like, obviously, (laughs) we're all going to electric, right? Um, But there's like also some alternative, um, you know, with the with the hydrogen fuels and and things of that sort. So there's other ways that that are being currently developed. Um, but it's strange to go from the combustion, you know, fossil fuel to the to the like heavy. It's changing the game across the board. Um, it's changing the way that 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 um, we design the um, the uh, um, facilities for for testing. Um, it, it, you know, it's changing even the way that the vehicle is built. It just takes less parts, um, so the buildings are becoming more efficient. Um, and then the whole point about do we have enough power? <laughs> That's been a big question. You know, um, it's one thing to have, um, you know, a handful of, 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 of electrical vehicles like, like on the road. Wait until there's, you know, complete fleets, and every car uh, home's got two or three of them in like um, like in the garage. So, you know, what at one point does it start to, you know, become you know are you know are we ready? That's, that's been kind of the big question. Yeah. Well, let's come back to the grid. Um, as an electrical engineer, I've got some <laughs> points to <laughs> talk about on that one, but the, the thing that I want to come back to is on the like plant design. Yeah. So, uh, I used to live in Louisville and we, uh, used to do a lot of work for, um, when I was there and working for a firm, uh, in Louisville, we did a lot of work for the Kentucky truck plant. That was one of our our big clients mm-hmm. uh, that we we helped with. So Ford's got their plant there, and most of the trucks on I think the eastern half of the U.S. come out of that plant. Yeah. And when we were putting um, new assembly lines in, um, and we were doing, I was doing this as they changed over from you know steel frames to aluminum frames. So then they had to put in different welding and the power requirements for those, you know, were dramatically different. They were a lot bigger for welding aluminum, um, than they were for steel, uh, in that the way that we kind of went about designing it. And I know you can't say too much and in, in how this goes in, but one of the things we ended up doing, uh, because a lot of the tooling that came after, so we were responsible for building design. I guess really this question goes to what piece of the design are you mm-hmm. ending up doing with HED? So ours was the building and infrastructure and then tooling would come in after and Correct. we just give them a, they're like, we think we need this big of a building. Yeah. <laughs> so we would come in and, you know, like we would then hope and change order like to make sure we give them all the right stuff after yeah. it because they didn't have it they didn't have tooling design done uh for the actual lines when we were putting the building together yeah so that's one of the biggest challenges then it all comes down to timing and i think the um really you know the manufacturing process is way ahead of the construction and what i mean that is they they plan ahead and they have the uh, you know, like, you know, like all the parts kind of figured out with the timing c- correct. Like, obviously it doesn't always work like exactly like I just said, but for most part, they have a better system. They have, um, 
uh, you know, even even just watching something like that build, you can tell that it's more efficient than the way with than the than the, than the way we build. In, in a perfect world, you would want to build from the inside out, and what I mean by that is, you know, have all of the process completed. Now, it doesn't always work that way because there's many many parts. Um, and I'm on the same same side, Dad, like you were. We build the infrastructure to build to, to, to like build the building. The only thing that I think we can do um, right now, and what we currently do, is to build in flexibility, um, because the plant is kind of change. It's going to retool, um, you know, and it and it really makes no sense to to uh, not to not to not make the steel um, you know strong enough to support some additional equipment. Um, you know, it's one you know it's one thing to be lean. It's another thing to be short minded. Um, that that there's going to be change, <laughs> and uh, uh, there's never been a project that I've been on that that didn't have some some level of change, and then it had a level of. Um, you know what we need to add another three bays to the project to to like accommodate so um so so designing ahead designing with change in mind and having a flexible team that's ready to pivot and move with the team that's the way to do it um but really if you can do the inside out approach um to most projects the building will come to shape it, it'll come to form um, and uh, it's a hard thing for sometimes the architect <laughs> hit myself to not try to design the building around the equipment. You got to design the equipment and then design the building, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the perfect scenario, right? Is that all like for most of these lines, it's tooling and die. You know, they come in first and do their yeah. piece and their line and where it goes and how long it is and what needs to be there. And yeah. Some of the time we have it, some of the time, you know, we need to break ground and steel needs to go up. So, um, you know, that's one of the challenges that we do on on those types of buildings and mm -hmm. for manufacturing, knowing also, too, that that line could last for three years. It could last for five, but that's probably about it. And then they're going to put in another one and yeah. hopefully it works <laughs> for that one yeah. too and then the new change when they switch over from from a gasoline um you know transmission power train to a fully like ev it, it um it does eliminate a few steps but it does create all you know other um ch challenges especially with a uh, uh, code or uh, you know um being that you have um you know you have uh these uh you know light batteries with a you know you know a myriad of uh of uh, you know uh, uh, chemicals inside, so you know how do you deal with that? Um, of course, we learned how to deal with fuels. It took us a you know you know nearly like a, a like a hundred years, but you know the codes are very clear um, when you're dealing with you know you know fuels and uh, like the vapors and there's rules. To, there's kind of rules that that all the like on a, uh, you know that the manufacturers have to follow. Um, with the batteries though, it's been kind of a new frontier. Uh, we're getting better, um, and the codes are starting to catch up, but it's you know it's still a learning uh, curve. Yeah, some of the work um, that I did also in Louisville was for uh, bourbon, and so one of the things in spirits, especially in bourbon in particular, because of the storage requirements for it, is they de and it's not really there's nothing in the code on how to do a lot of this stuff, but it's, you know, a literal trial by fire. You know, you learn, lose a couple warehouses by fire. If they figured out how to, you know, space out their warehouses to make sure that if one burned, it doesn't take everything down. Yeah. Um, and a lot of other, they call it like the distiller's handbook in how to really design and build these facilities specifically for um, alcohol related, you know, storage, uh, especially, you know, over, with bourbon, you know, it's going to age for eight, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on what you're, you're doing. So they, uh, they figure that out by, by themselves and kind of issue their own. And then you store them in oak with which burns pretty well, <laughs> especially when it's soaked in alcohol. Right. Yeah. So, um, I guess with that has, has the industry come together kind of on a, on a handbook for like some of the battery storage or some of these other kind of more technical nuances that only, you know, manufacturers of electric vehicles would, you know, dive into. 
Um, yes and no. Uh, the problem is you have uh, three or four code bodies that all come together. You know, you have, um, you know, um, uh, you know, like the fire codes and you have the electrical codes and then you have the, uh, you know, like the building codes and they all kind of intertwine and, and in some ways contradict. Um, if it's a very complicated project, um, we typically would have a code, a code consultant, um, uh, you know, kind of, a, kind of a, like a third party, uh, like expert come in and help us. And that's uh, kind of common of most like AE firms. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty good at what, at what we do and we're, and we, and we know enough. There's that level of, uh, of like expertise that, you know, it's almost good to have a real like expert in the field doing that, who, who does it quite often. Um, and so when there's a time that it's above and beyond our, our own skill set, we have no like issue going to a code, to a code consultant. And these guys are like the myth, um, you know, these guys can be like the myth, uh, light busters. They'll actually burn something or blow it up to, to really like, like understand it. And, and until the codes really, um, you know, what adopt it and like understand, it's sustained it big could take years and the problem is the technology is changing so quickly it's hard it's hard to keep up i i you know really don't think that it will ever be up to speed but um hopefully i'm being um you know hopefully that that they can at some point right yeah it's just those best practices you know to share across the industry like especially when it comes to things i'm sure like battery storage or um if you're dealing with any of the plants that are actually assembling batteries yeah. Um, things like that, that, you know, hopefully would be shared. Obviously there's going to be some trade secrets in there somewhere. Um, but the kind of common things that, you know, how to not blow up a facility or, you know, with, you know spills yeah. or things like that, you know, hopefully would be shared. Yeah. We have a, um, we have an oath and I'm sure most of the like engineering community does too. We're here, we're here to protect the public and, uh, and that's what we're, um, you know, that's really our main, main goal. <laughs> Um, to to protect the buildings, to protect the people. That's that's really what what we're here to do. Awesome. Um, circling back to the power grid, and you know we can kind of get into the whole EV adoption piece of this. Is you know as more and more EVs are on the road, um, you know to the point you made earlier in the grid and it being ready. Um, that is a very interesting question. And I think one, I don't think it is Two, the bigger piece in that is who pays ultimately for the upgrades to the grid. I think that's the, the bigger question is, you know, obviously we can deal with charging and the use of the grid for, you know, this increased consumption uh, and demand really on power generation from a grid standpoint, when you move all the energy that's consumed in gasoline, uh, over to, you know, electricity, then, you know, like that's a huge <laughs> energy transfer from, yeah. you know, a, a transportable liquid into, you know, the, the energy grid. So, I mean, I think ultimately we need the upgrades, but the, the bigger question that I'm curious about is, you know, who ultimately pays for those upgrades in a private, privately owned utility. Yeah, that's a, that one's going to be tough because like, obviously the, you know, utilities like operate in a, um, I want to say it, it's kind of like a monopoly really. I mean, cause there's not like there's, um, I mean, you know, every town has their, their go-to power, um, um, you know, uh, uh, group. And, um, I know locally they're, they're trying to, you know, they're planning ahead. Um, you know, at least the one here in, uh, like the Metro Detroit and, you know, it's going to be something that's going to take time. It, it, it's something that's going to be, um, uh, you know, it's going to be very expensive. Um, but at the same time, I think if, uh, again, as, as slow adoption happens, I think it may be more, you know, more palatable, um, for, for, for the private like industry to really pay for it. Um, I think that there's going to be some government, uh, 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 like advocacy and, um, some, some funds spent to help that. Um, but one thing that I don't really know if too, too many people are really looking at is there's been a push to, to take a lot of the buildings off of, uh, natural gas. 
Um, and we're talking from, you know, it's probably not so big in the South or, or the West, but here um, we use, um, we, we use a lot of um, uh, fuel to actually heat. And there's been a big push to create zero carbon, uh, st uh, um, you know, uh, heating sources. And, you know, you know, it's like obviously a great thing, right? It's, you know, it's the right direction. Um, but the question is, can the grid support that as well? So that means what's going to heat the building? It's probably going to be electric or something of that sort. Um, so we need to, to, really, to really keep our eyes on that as well. So like the the pushback on the the grid thing and the natural gas is okay okay if you're going to get your electricity if you're going to heat a building on pure electric one you just cut uh efficiency by 30% cuz natural gas is a way fit more efficient heat source than electricity two is where are you getting that electricity from Yeah yeah and it's most likely from a Unfortunately, it, people don't want to hear this, but it's either from a coal-fired or a, uh, a natural gas-fired, uh, you know, heat source um, or um, uh, light power source to actually turn to turn the you know, and um, you know, there's obviously you know nuclear, there's wind, there's solar, and there's uh, hydro, um, but is it enough? <laughs> That's the biggest piece. You know, can it support without using uh, what a fossil fuel and i know that that's been a big push and um you know when i'm um you know when i'm very uh like active in the aia the american uh institute of architects and we have a you know we're trying to do our part to save the planet and um you know like obviously it's not any it's not like an easy task and i don't think there's really one correct correct answer yeah i mean just it's it becomes really interesting right because you're going to spend uh, like let's take the natural gas thing. So San Francisco outlawed natural gas uh, in new construction uh, in the city. So you take that, which basically San Francisco, if you've never been there, they pretty much, they, they don't need air conditioning. <laughs> let's put it that way. So these buildings are, you know, primarily need heat for the majority of the year. And so now you're going to take, and any new build is going to need 30% more energy because just on pure heating, right? Because you take from natural gas. So instead of heating with natural gas, you're going to put in electricity, which is a 30% increase in power required to do the same KW in heating in BTU. So, and you have to now transport that from now outside the city, right? From a natural gas plant, which is what is going to power it there. Because San Francisco also will not allow windmills to be built outside the city uh, or in the water. Right, they are sixty miles east of them uh, is where the majority of windmills for San Francisco is. So, and then like hydro is not really a valid option, you know. And most of the, it's it is out west, right? The Columbia River powers most all the west coast, um, mm -hmm. but hydro isn't really a, a big power uh, production piece east of Colorado. So when you look at like just San Francisco, in this you're going to increase. The amount of power required to heat buildings 30 percent for any new construction I, like the math <laughs> doesn't compute for know. me <laughs> yeah something's not yeah i mean you know um and again it's you know you fix one one you know one one leak but there's another leak right you know and it's like where do you um you know you fix one problem but others one's tend to come up and and the grid is another like issue and anybody who was around at least this um in the detroit lake area and i think it was affected you know ohio cleveland and new york in 2005 we had a power grid shut you know shut down for multiple days and it was because of the equipment um and it was lack of uh you know you know you know like upgrades and infrastructure um i'm just afraid that that at some point, you know, it may happen again and it may happen again and again, you know, because it's happened um, from, from, you know, a few uh, years back it happened. I think, I think in Texas where they had a big, um, you know, like a cold spell and they lost their, their grid as well. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, like anxiety around that um, and having, uh, you know, being efficient and being able to support it.
at the same time. Yeah, I mean, there, there's the difference in resiliency, right, and efficiency, right? Yeah. Those are two very different things, right? Efficient is single source and, you know, very efficient, large power plants that can serve, you know, a large area. Resiliency is multiple power plants that, you know, serve smaller areas. But again, if some if you lose one, it's not as big a deal if you lose, the, you know, one main one. Um, we see that in lo a lot of areas. And the when the grid goes down... Um, People often forget that, especially when you're doing, um, well, really any any power plant for coal, uh, natural gas, when those do go down, they do take, when they and they become cold, it does take, you know, a day to restart a given plant. So, you know, when we talk about resiliency, you know, when a plant, a power plant goes down, right, for whatever reason, a lot of the one in 05 was one of the main lines outside of uh, Ottawa, in Canada, one of the hydro plants up on um, Niagara got hit by, or uh, a chain ended up hitting from like a log truck or something, ended up hitting one of the main lines, and then it took down one of the main power plants, which then um, put all the other power plants out of frequency. So what the, really the only mandate within power plants is that you're at frequency. Yeah. So they don't care about like voltage. So you can be 130 volts at the front end of the line or 100, 100 volts on the back end of the line. So like voltage is not a mandated thing. It's 60 Hertz. So when you're, you fall below like 58 Hertz, you end up cutting off the power plant. Cause then it, it messes up all the other uh, turbines. So I know this is very like technical, but it, when we start talking about these things, it like, it really matters. Um, and that's how like, the Ottawa plant got uh, and hydro got shut down, like all their uh, gear opened so that no more power was flowing. And then it put the load on everything else because it was one of the major plants. So then you had rolling blackouts is what happened in um, 03 is when that happened in New York um, that ended up taking out most of the Eastern seaboard. Because again, you had a very, like you had a big plant that failed first versus if you had a smaller plant that failed first, it wouldn't have caused the the rolling nature that it did because you couldn't transfer that much power that quickly. And this is the other thing that when we talk about renewables, where like you can't say, okay, wind, please blow today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or in the Midwest, you know, sun, please come out. Like that you can't quite do that. Yes. So one of the things that we've been involved in is, um, is um, he, you know, um, installing vehicle chargers in like buildings or for the like automotives and um these tend to get pretty large now i mean you know what it used to be this little plug and so so now you know so now it's you know how, you know how much faster how much bigger can we make these and we're doing um full full um uh, draws right from the substations right down to these uh, rapid chargers and uh, they're pretty quick. It just, they'll never be installed in your home because you don't have that type of power. Um, but, you know, the question becomes how safely can you move electricity from one source to another without having a problem, right? You know, it's, uh, there's obviously a lot of things with heat and current and all types of things that uh, could, could play like a factor. And um, when, once you go from a higher blade voltage, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, draw and you're feeding a, a, a like a battery at rapid speed pace, um, you know, the potential for thermal uh, light runaway is, per is pretty high. Um, so it's something that uh, has to be done properly and safely. And, um, you know, it has to be like engineered. And that's where we come into, to, to, you know, you know, what to help them out. So are you doing the, um, like on a Tesla charger as your role to really just outline the power draw from the, and you know, where they yeah. go, that kind of stuff. And then Correct. from the substation to the. Yeah. Units. So for us, it's, um, the same as, uh, uh, hooking up or, or designing the like infrastructure to the equipment. Yeah. Awesome. Do you see the, I mean, are you guys putting in a lot of those across yes. the country? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, being uh, like a national practice, we have um, uh, clients that span, you know, 
span from 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 coast to coast. Yeah, so we so we'll do work for them uh, to install those. And it's really for us, it's another piece of equipment. That's how we treat it. Um, but it does have a draw. And there is, um, and the funny thing is when you power, uh, it, you know, what it, you know, what it's all about, like timing, you know, if you have a bank of 12 chargers, um, are they all going to be at the same time? Or, you know, is there diversity there? Will some be used at night during the day? You know, it's, uh, it all makes a difference. Yeah. I mean, in engineering, like stuff like that, I'd, I'd imagine there's like zero diversity factor for yeah, people. There's very little. <laughs> yeah. It's always yeah. peak, right? You have to work. You always focus on worst case. Like that's yeah. the. Yeah. So when they start to build these, let's say, uh, charging stations uh, around the country, um, how do you get the power there? That's going to be the big uh, question. Um, you know, what I know that there's quite a few just here here that have, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot like on the West Coast as well, wherever you are, um, that has the, you know, like the chargers and, you know, people have to charge like their vehicles. And it's not as, uh, you know, it may not be as quick as going to the to the gas pump, um, but um, I'm sure the technology is going to going to going to going to fix that eventually. Yeah, being in California, especially like living outside of Yosemite as a corridor that people travel pretty frequently and uh, Tesla having their, well, not their headquarters anymore, but big presence <laughs> here in California. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a ton of Tesla superchargers um, throughout, you know, and you see them and, you know, you see them more and more at edges of parking lots and things like that where they can easily get powered to those superchargers. So kind of moving away from a little bit on the, the grid stuff um, to what else are you seeing in construction that really would allow us to, to move faster. And again, I wish Matt was here for, for this one, sure. he might uh, kick himself a little bit on it, but is when you have, um, you know, Matt's big thing is design build. Right. And even, if, you know, from, my uh, engineering experience and in, in as many buildings as I've done, even the ones that were quote considered <laughs> uh, design build was really a design bid build with the GC holding the the master contract yep. um, where, you know, pricing really wasn't put forward initially, which is what, you know, Matt ex really specializes in is him putting together a price, you know, a schedule and doing that up front, And then, you know, bringing in his trusted architects and trusted uh, trade partners to to come behind and, you know, kind of flesh out the rest of it, put, you know, full numbers to it. But his pricing, and that's what kind of differentiates him in the market, is being able to give a price up front to that client and then them be able to hold, you know, price and buy, you know, I think he would even attest to this, that schedule these days is <laughs> maybe not the easiest to hold to with supply yeah. chain, but sure. you know, the goal is to, to hold price and schedule. And obviously that's the, the contractor's responsibility is to hold price and schedule and to do that up front. but kind of your take on um, really it's going to be more contractual than anything. Sure. Oh no, we, for real. We approach, uh, you know, design and, and getting everybody on the same team. Cause at the end of the day, we all want great buildings for our clients. Yeah. And, um, you know, had I've been on, on, on multiple sides of, of the contract and really, uh, it depends it, it, again, it depends like on the project and on the building and on, uh, on the team, but really it, it comes down to a couple simple things and, and it's really, it's trust it's, um, you know, teamwork, um, and uh, really the most successful design build projects that I've been on have been where a price has been like established at the front end. Um, a contractor was able to select select the partners or they were brought in as a team approach um, through the and and again, the client was involved from from day one and till the end of the project. Therefore, too, you know, having, having respect for, for each of the trades and like each of the group and realizing that what may not be best for one 
group may not be best for the art, for the architect or engineer, or even the contractor, what's best for the project, putting the project first. Um, those have been to me the best, the, the, you know, the most, the most um, su successful. And then when you have that, that team approach and you really do a true design build, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, things that, uh, that are normal to the construction like industry that don't have to happen. And that kind of seamlessly flow, flow through, um, during, during construction, because really, uh, the design phase is, you know, is quite short compared to the, to the, to the actual build phase. And, um, you know, what, you know, what, again, you know, working through the schedule and, uh, delivering the drawings as if, the products were going on site, you know, it's the um, uh, just in time type of uh, type of approach, um, where where if you're putting up a new building, you're 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 building it the way that the schedule wants to build it, and you're designing it the way the schedule wants to be, wants to build it. Um, so certain things have to happen before the other part happens, and that really comes into a lot of doing 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 a lot of work up front. We call it. Um, here we we call it going uh, you know going slow to go fast, so it takes a little more time up front to do that and to establish a price to to establish what what we're gonna do. Um, sometimes it takes um, some effort from the AE to actually develop uh, you know like a pricing set or or some level of uh, of the building that everybody is comfortable moving forward, taking a step back and saying, is that what, what we what we want to do? And then moving forward for, for, from, from there. So not like ordering steel on the first day type of thing, you know, or not ordering, uh, you know, all the equipment. Let's, let's, uh, uh, you know, let's, uh, you know, go slow to go fast. And it's uh, kind of a, been a, you know, and, and the, at the end of those projects you realize that sometimes that's the best thing that you did was hold was hold back <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i mean especially today you know steel's taken 40 50 plus weeks to even from <laughs> even if you said go it's yeah. still not gonna be there um i would i would totally agree on taking the time in design to flesh out a lot of those things and to have uh, and like you said, the worst projects I've worked on is, um, I would say adversarial. Uh, I would say that, you know, not, not everyone was fully invested in it. You know, we'd create a, a pricing set and then it never got to like the trade partners to fully, you know, price out or to, especially on, if you're trying to do something what's, you know, fast track or on a design bid build or design build process where the trade partners right like the electrical contractor never saw the drawings yeah. or a mechanical contractor and they don't have any ways to improve or think of how they could you know either save money or save schedule or anything like that and that goes for you know the the drywaller the other specialty contractors that are involved in the project you know if they're not a part of it and they don't see those drawings man like that <laughs> it creates it's like you're, yeah, you're not there's some animosity the there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like obviously, it's a uh, uh, it could be very complicated, and um, and that's where where I think the the teaming approach and um, you know, some of the some of the other projects where we did have um, uh, uh, design assist or or trade partners kind of helping out during the design is huge. Um, because like, obviously, um, you know, you'd be surprised how much the trades know about construction, that they know a lot. <laughs> They're actually very good at it. <laughs> um, and, and to bridge that, that gap early in the project and to plan ahead is, uh, critical. I mean, we do like all of our work in a 3d like environment. So we like to flush out the problems before they become the, the, the they like issues. And by having the trade, uh, partners involved in the 3d uh, uh you know like model with you um putting in you know the actual parts and pieces that uh you know you know typically is not included in the ae set um can really help solve some some like issues it's a lot less expensive to do it in the model than it is when it's in the field um and then it comes to to when when the model is 
uh, uh, you know, um, uh, coordinated uh, and and virtually cl clash free, it can then be used for fabrication. Um, so it so it allows the contractors to go through and uh, pre build and uh, and uh, you know hopefully make some modular uh, parts that can be shipped like on site and installed rather quickly. It's you know it's safer, it's faster, it's easier. It's been proven time time and time again on multiple. Uh, but it, you know again it comes back to communication and trust, and that's one of the two big things that that are really required. Yeah, which brings up, so there's a couple of good points you hit on there. You know, my forte and what I do now is, you know, build software for Revit, for automation, for moving faster through those models, uh, since there is just a lot of repetition that we can kind of pull out of the processes and allow people to, to move through those projects faster. And with a, a Revit model, um, the thing I want to, I guess, talk about is when you think of, especially on these coordinated models, right? So when your your team together, trade partners are involved, or maybe even not, is the putting in for fabrication, right, into the model. And, you know, a lot of this is going to still come down to contracts and who's responsible for what yep. um, in that. But, you know, as a engineer, like luckily, you know, my experience um and internships and everything else was taken up. Like I got to go and take apart electrical gear, right? We were into actual operational facilities. We, I took, you know, gear covers off. I helped electricians through a lot of that stuff and got exposure to like how these things are built, you know, how cables run a lot of things that most engineers don't get to be a part of. And it gave me a lot of good experience in how these systems really get put together, you know, in a lot of facilities across the country uh, when I went to then be on the design side and <laughs> putting these together and not uh, so much in operational facilities. But the the question I have is in that model is how much, you know, either training or um, emphasis should we put on design on the design team in kind of going more towards that design to fabrication granted like tooling and spooling and all those other things that's it that we can kind of push that one aside yep, for right now because i know yeah. that's a that's a deeper conversation but if you can kind of see where i'm going with this in mm -hmm. you know more design for fabrication and detailing out those parts granted i know this is a big contractual piece on who does what and sure. who gets paid for what yeah <laughs> yeah uh, you know principle. I've been a big proponent of, um, you know, you know, the architect and the engineer staying as the master of late builder. And over time, um, it seems like a lot of that responsibility has been slipped away, um, you know, and uh, and for right or wrong, you know, and um, um, uh, it's a slippery slope because, again, um, we tend to to limit our our like, exposure to to the construction side. So. Um, I have been seeing more uh, emphasis on like steel design. It, it, the, um, you know, it seems like that's been going a little bit further than just the 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 analytical like model getting a little more into um, to to kind of more of a fab to to a fab level. On the other uh, light disciplines, it's been mostly going to to more of the design intent. Um, you know, sizing the wire, sizing the conduits, sizing the ductwork, so sizing the units, but but getting a little more um, less cartoony and less it, and more into a construction that then you know the model can then be transferred to to the uh, to the contractor um, and then then really used rather than kind of like thrown away. Um, and that's, I think the gap that I think that, that, that we can definitely help. And I think it's the right handoff rather than, then, you know, then, you know, then giving you a 2d set of plans, give you a model. And that's been kind of a big helpful piece of it. And then what it, what it becomes beyond that is, um, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of, it, you know, like, you know like been the hands of the installer type of, uh, uh, you know, role. And then bringing that back, and then then making a final light model, I think, is the most successful piece. Um, yeah, it's a slippery slope because there's obviously swim lanes, and 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 we all need to 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 respect that. 
and a lot of times um, we don't want to get too involved into the installation piece of it just because there's a lot of um, nuances there. Um, but for most part, I think if we could do a better job of creating actual, you know, light develop, light models, we can then, you, you know, the trades can use those much more like effectively. That's good to hear. I mean, I've been on that, uh, that team for, for a long time and, you know, the, the trade shouldn't have to throw away our work and, yeah. you know, I don't think anybody necessarily wants that either. Right. Yeah. Let's <laughs> so get have... lean. Right. Yeah. Let's not make waste. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then how do you see this playing into to modular construction and kind of the role there in yeah. moving towards, you know, modular builds? Well, you know, you know, um, you know, you brought it up, I think, like earlier on how, um, you know, you know, bringing the, the, the architect and the contractor together sooner. Um, you know, again, it comes down to what the building is going to be in price. And there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like avenues, but for most part, if you could design the building, knowing, knowing how, how, um, you know, you could really build this thing. Um, could really be a huge, huge benefit for all parties. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times in uh, in in the uh, uh, design of like a healthcare, let's call you know, say like a tower hospital, where where you have these, you know, like the patient rooms are pretty much pretty much the same, um, but you know there could be some nuances, you know, uh, you know from floor to floor. But if you could design them so they could almost be pre-built off-site and then shipped, and then you can control, you know, you know, again, um, <laughs> you know, if anybody's been on a construction site, it can get quite quite messy. Um, the weather could be like a factor. Um, things things get wet. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's hard to sometimes construct and build. If you could build those things in a um, uh, warehouse or a factory, and then have them shipped you know, like on site and be ready when the next piece is, you know, what is ready to be placed. Um, and, and it's plug and play. I mean, that's really the, what I would see that the, you know, like the future of construction. Yeah, I would totally agree, especially in healthcare settings, you know, I've designed my fair share of patient rooms, uh, like doing the head wall is probably the, the primary yep. one. And then uh plug and play, like, um, the sink and countertop units, if you can at least slide those in, um, that would be a, another huge benefit, at least that, you know, six, eight foot section uh, and the head wall, that full wall, and then the at least that countertop and uh, cabinetry, like that would be a huge, huge benefit uh, and yeah. save a ton of time and at least have, you know, even if the, the walls are open to have all your, your med gases and everything on the head wall, yeah. uh, power, you know, conduits run all that kind of stuff to where you're now all the trades can come in and do their final connections yeah. and terminations and it just saves everyone a ton a ton of time and it makes yeah. them do what they're great at <laughs> correct and nothing's worse than having a schedule where you have let's say the electrical contractor come out and then he's got to demobilize and then he's got to come back and that's just inefficient and um i'm sure any Buddy in our like industry would would agree that that is a, a, a like a wasteful move. So um, let's think about that, and let's think about how we're gonna you know you know when you're designing, let's think how we're gonna build. That's uh, uh, kind of a big thing, and and uh, you know time is money on everybody's side. And if you could uh, eliminate just a few steps in every construction pro project, um, you'll save money, you'll you'll save time, and um, you know hopefully you have a bit you know like a better uh, you know product yeah i mean if you're doing let's just say 10 million in revenue and you save one percent i mean it's 100 grand straight to the bottom line That's, you know yeah <laughs> which gets me into a whole nother uh level of uh contract is the uh the ipd the mm -hmm. uh, uh you know the you know the you know the you know the integrated project uh, uh, delivery approach where really the team becomes a kind of a shared like unit and there's risk and, and reward we'll, and we'll go into that another time it's probably a whole nother session like on that but that's a, a whole nother way that the future is going to be at some point yeah i would actually when we can talk about this offline too but um would love to put a show together to just talk about contracts i think i bring it up enough <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you really could 
contractual nuances between like how, you know, these types of projects would go together, responsibility, what's good, what's bad, you know, what's good for the owner, what's good for design firms, contractors, you know, who wins out of each of them, I think would be a very interesting conversation to have, you know, and bring everybody to the table to, you know, and have kind of a round table discussion on uh, contracts. <laughs> yeah. And I, I tell you, it's the, it's the one topic that nobody really wants to get into, but uh, we all get into it. And um, to understand them and to, uh, you know, uh, it, there's obviously no perfect contract for any, for like anybody, but there's ones that I think we all could, uh, could agree are, are better approaches to, uh, you know, like to keep in everybody, you know, um, you know, sane. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and Todd, before we get to into the kind of last question here, where can everybody find you? Sure. Um, I can be found, um, you know, the, uh, the best way to find, to, uh, to find our company is through uh, HED uh, Debt Design. Uh, we're, uh, we're found, like, obviously we have like offices uh, like around the country. I can be found at a T Drilliard at HED dot design. And, uh, you know, again, we do work, uh, nationally and we do some international work as well. Um, so. Awesome. And I'll have all those links in the show notes guys. So you can go and follow Todd and, uh, check out what he's up to. But, the last question that we have before we, we break here is construction is a, is a big industry. You know, when we take the totality of it, you know, it's over a trillion just in commercial, just here in the U S that's not including single family homes, uh, which puts that, you know, probably into the multiple trillions of dollars that is put into construction every year. And that's not even, you know, considering finance and, you know, all the other pieces that come around, uh, construction, that's just construction dollars. So, as big of an industry as it is, you know, like anything, there's always some problems, uh, but we also want to find solutions. So what's maybe one of the big problems that, that you see with our industry um, and how can we go about solving it? Uh, one of the big ones is, and, and I'm, and, and I'm sure it's something that's been on like everybody's mind is, uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, the really the supply chain. And, you know, I know it's a tough thing to, you know, it's a tough like egg to crack and it, and it's a, big problem. And, uh, I think using, you know, we could really look towards, um, you know, some of the big companies that are doing it right. Um, you know, warehousing the right products, where, how, how housing the, the right thing, having that, that kind of that last mile approach, uh, to, to like shipping. And I'm sure I, I would almost foresee that most of the bigger, uh, supply companies are thinking about this and, you know, like doing it, but until we really see it happening, it's going to be a problem, uh, for some time. Um, so if, if anything, if we could help solve or help, uh, uh, you know, what eliminate and fix the supply chain, because it's really been a problem, um, for some time now, and, and, and it only gotten worse during, during the, uh, with the pandemic, um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think as more manufacturing comes back to the U.S., you know, you're seeing silicon manufacturing coming back, um, and those plants should be online here next year um, for chip manufacturing and a lot more manufacturing just coming back to the U.S. Um, I think that'll improve a lot of the supply chain. Obviously, with so many things being so far out, um, all those plants have to come online. They have to come into full production for us to just get caught back up to where yeah. – um, we can be in kind of a normal state, but I would, you know, I think that is the big one. <laughs> I think, you know, the solution is really just keep building in America and, you know, and bringing that supply chain closer to home is I think yeah. the, the message. Yep. And that's really going to help. I think the, uh, the, uh, with the pinch points, um, of the like industry and, um, you know, take for instance, like electrical gear, you know, just getting that, uh, like on board, it's, you know, here's outrageous like lead times on a lot of this equipment and it's just been really 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 tough any final words todd um just uh really again i really want to approach the you know you know if we approach the projects uh, like in a teaming approach um you know huge fan of that um i think most people are and uh yeah just, uh, so again if anybody is ever interested in uh 
in the profession, I also uh, um, try to uh, try to inspire young young architects and young young like engineers to um, to look into the profession. Um, we have a we have a supply chain issue there as well. So uh, let's uh, let's see if anybody can want wants to step up, and we'd be more than glad to help them out. Absolutely, guys. Um, and Todd, thank you so much for coming on. I think that's a great message. You know, we try to push that here quite a bit is, you know, making the trades cool again is one of those things, you know, and whatever f form you want to come into the construction industry, you know, we need you, whether yes. you want to be in the field, in the office, you know, an architect, an engineer, um, contractor, we need kind of everybody through, <laughs> through the whole, whole life cycle um, of design and building and maintenance. You know, I know a lot of facilities managers that are, um, retiring and they, uh, would it's like a great profession. To, yes. Would like somebody to come behind them. So thank you so much for, for coming on today, Todd, you know, we covered a wide range of topics from, uh, electric vehicles, the grid to, you know, automotive to modular construction. And then again, uh, bringing people into the trades and, the big message here is guys work as a team. That's uh, so important to getting a successful project across the line and having a building that you can be proud of at the end of the day. So with that, thank you again, Todd, for coming on. And that's this episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. Until next time.